Our call to worship comes from Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name.
us one. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and the understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Still recording the messages, but now we 
Uh, if, if you're sort of catching up with us now, we're uh, here at West Leonard back to online only services uh, as a result of uh, the increasing uh, COVID-19 cases in our region. Uh, and uh, regardless of that being true uh, and wanting to be uh, sort of wise in how we handle things, uh, we still as a community of faith recognize that our God is in control uh, and we're thankful for the ability to uh, do worship in this way. A uh, special welcome to anyone who happens to stumble across this message uh, sort of through someone's Facebook, they've shared it, and I know that, oh man, I, it, when we first were doing them, we had people from Texas who, who somehow connected with uh, our church's messages. So special welcome to you. Um, a couple of quick announcements before we get into our sermon series, Reasons for Rejoicing, uh, that we have been going through the book of Philippians, and uh, you know, looking at this letter that Paul wrote from prison, awaiting a, essentially a death sentence, is what he thought was at the end of this, reasonably so, and yet he continuously is rejoicing and calling the church in Philippi to rejoice. But before we get into the message and, and sort of continue with that series, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the first announcement I want to make is just, uh, it's really a reminder of kind of the way things were back when we were doing the online only, uh, is uh, first off, uh, pay attention to your email for announcements if you're a member here at the church. Uh, Announce updates on prayer requests, etc. will be primarily through there. With our online recordings, we try not to include people's personal information. And so if you notice that we don't mention those things, but you heard about something going on in our community that typically in a live service we would mention from the pulpit uh, for prayer and just to let people know, uh, be aware those will be in the email. Be a little extra diligent about your emails. Uh, that is specifically also related to um, in updates on sort of the shutdown. Uh, as of right now, we, uh, man, we're really hoping that the cases de decline in such a way that uh, we can return as soon as possible. But uh, nevertheless, we want to continue to take uh, important safety measures as they are necessary. Please watch your email for those announcements as well. Um, the last thing I just want to uh, address uh, quite quickly, a special just pastoral word uh, to everyone uh, who is a member here at West London Church. I know the prospect of uh, church services, uh, live services being shut down for the holiday season is unbelievably difficult to stomach. Um, I want you to know you are not alone in your feelings of that being sort of a gut punch. Um, it is never easy to not be able to gather together. It is especially difficult when we are entering towards Advent season here in the next couple weeks where we celebrate, uh, importantly, the, the birth of Jesus. And, uh, and I just want to give a word of encouragement. Uh, if you're feeling... Uh, like this is really hard, it's because it is. It is really hard. Even though it's difficult, uh, it may very well be the right decision um, understanding what's going on. Uh, we have many in our community that have gotten sick. Praise God, and we're so thankful that over the six months we were meeting, uh, we never had anyone that we knew of that came to the service who later tested uh, positive for COVID. Uh, we took lots of precautions, and so this isn't his testimony whatsoever about whether the precautions were not enough. This is, uh, however, a testimony that the rise in the cases is very different than it was six months ago. It's very different than it was even a month ago. Uh, and so just an encouragement. Uh, our God is good, and he is with us no matter what in our faith is not ultimately, even though they are valuable and meaningful to us, it is not contingent on whether we're able to gather together during a specific season. Our faith is bigger than that. And so uh, just thank you and the Lord's peace be with all of you. And this includes, if you're a, a, a guest, uh, just someone who stumbled across this, I know that with the holiday season and with the rise of COVID, um, it is... Uh, sort of an especially scary time. But as I say so often to members here at the church, uh, we are 
a group of people that God has told time and time again, his word, the number one command in his word is do not be afraid. And while practicing common sense and making some decisions uh, to limit things is part of that stewardship of what God has given us, it is never to be characterized or fueled out of fear. And so if you're experiencing fear right now, I pray that the God of this world, who is our sovereign Lord, would come into your life in a special way to give you peace in this difficult time. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship today. We thank you despite limitations. We thank you despite disappointments. We thank you despite some of the worries of this world because you are good and nothing, nothing changes that goodness. Lord, so we begin our prayer today with thanksgiving. There is always something to thank you for. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts today Wherever we are, that you would give comfort to us. For those who are struggling for comfort, you would give peace. For those who are struggling for peace, Lord, we thank you for the upcoming Advent season. And the fact that we celebrate God with us, Emmanuel. And that has not stopped. You are still with us. Because of Jesus' work on the cross, you are with your people always. And I pray that we would know that abundantly. Lord, we do petition you, precisely because you are with us, to bring healing and restoration in this world. There are people who are sick. There are people who have died. There are people who have lost loved ones. And there are people who are fearful that they may. Lord, I pray for healing in every respect in Jesus' name. You taught your people to pray on earth as it is in heaven. And we know that fear, sickness, distress, pain, none of this is a part of heaven. Show us a measure of heaven today, even more so, as individuals and as a church and as a nation and as a world. Lord, we thank you for what you're about to say today. We thank you for your message. I pray that the Spirit would be with each person listening, whether it's in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning, like sort of typical on a Sunday morning. Lord, I pray your Spirit would just abound and it would take this word and confirm it in our hearts. Lord, thank you for what you're about to do. No one gets to see this message without being changed. Everyone experiences the transforming love of Jesus today. We pray all of this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. So continuing our sermon series, Reasons for Rejoicing, where we've been going through the book of Philippians, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 9 today. A fairly small little section of scripture, and uh, one that... Uh, many people, including myself, have a tendency to sort of read over, particularly the first part of this, because it just seems to be sort of this brief mention of a specific event uh, that was happening in the Philippian church and a piece of advice or a piece of encouragement that Paul gives regarding that. But I'm going to suggest to you that uh, this is far more important because it's actually something we deeply experience. And the second part of the passage is sort of a prescription uh, that Paul is giving for how to handle this conflict. Now, I'll say it again before the end of this message, I'm quite certain, but this prescription is not only for the specific problem we're going to talk about today, but we're going to talk about the specific problem for our lives too because it is a prevalent problem and challenge, and this prescription that is given uh, is part of how we navigate that. So starting at chap uh, chapter 4, verse 2. I plead with Eodia and Syntyche 
I plead with her to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, to help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. A couple sermons ago, actually, if you wanted to look back at it, it happened to be the Sunday right before the U.S. elections. Um, we talked about something that he addresses in sort of a broad sense earlier in the letter. Paul does the issue of disunity, the issue of conflict and uh, sort of people being uh, sort of negative towards each other and, and, and not having peace with each other, even within the church. He, and he sort of said, you know, among Christians, we are meant to stand out from the world by having a unity and peace amongst each other that is unlike the rest of the world. And I mentioned in that message, I said that he's going to talk about a specific instance of this later on. That very likely it was something that was sort of a general thing they were struggling with. But there's also a specific instance he is going to mention of conflict between two individuals. And that is the beginning of our section we read here today. There are two women in this church. Eodia and Syntyche, forgive me if that pronunciation is, I looked up a variety and they were all very different, okay? So put it in the comments, correct my pronunciation, that's perfectly fine. But these two women uh, are, are people that we don't know a lot about, they're briefly mentioned, and again, you can kind of go past this section really fast if you're reading Philippians, right? You're just like, oh, he addresses this issue with two people. But I want to urge us not to because there's some important things going on here. First off, we don't know a lot about them, but we know that it's serious enough that he addresses their specific conflict. He doesn't say what's wrong, but if it wasn't a serious conflict, he could have just left it to the larger thing about unity and having peace and compassion and care for each other that he did earlier in the letter. But he mentions these two specific women and their conflict. And he mentions that he knows these women. They were co-workers of his. They were fellow workmen in the sharing of the gospel. We don't know exactly whom they were, but they may have been traveling companions of Paul's at one point, or possibly pastors or, or, or leaders in the church in some capacity. And they're mentioned alongside Clement. If you're a church history buff, Clement is a very early church father, a well-known church father who wrote quite a bit uh, that, that church uh, theologians study his writings. These are two significant people, even though they're mentioned very briefly. They're leaders in the church, and there's a conflict amongst them that is serious enough that Paul says he has to address specifically. He says, help these women to be of one Mind. This isn't just about being in agreement on something. This is about a conflict that needs to be resolved. Paul was not unfamiliar with conflict between himself and other Christians and even other leaders. 
In many places through Paul's writings, he addresses the fact that there are people who want to do him harm. There are people who criticize him, who, who question his credentials as an apostle, who sort of cause question of whether he's legitimate. Even earlier in Philippians, he mentions people who are preaching the gospel to spite him and stir up trouble for him, even though they are preaching the true gospel. And he actually says he's thankful for that. They are causing problems for him. We know that Paul has, uh, there's an issue with Peter, another apostle, that's addressed in the book of Galatians, because Peter is, is walking into some areas of, of uh, sort of theology where he's stop, starting to not acknowledge Gentile Christians, and Paul and him sort of get into a, a fight about it. We even see an example in the book of Acts, where Paul, who's traveling with his companion Barnabas, a good friend of his, and they planted churches together. It says that they have a disagreement. It actually leads them to part ways. And from that point on, they go about their gospel work separately from each other. Paul, perhaps, is looking at this situation and thinking about his own struggles with relationship conflicts, his own struggles with disagreements, his own struggles with the pain of broken relationships, and he thinks about these two women and says, I want you to see healing and reconciliation between you. But he doesn't really say much about it. He doesn't really say how. He doesn't say what the problem is. I mean, don't you imagine that some conflicts with people, the problem is so great that it seems almost impossible to fix and mend that relationship? I know that when I think about my own life, it certainly feels that way. In this series, we've been talking about reasons that the Christian faith gives us to rejoice. And there are many, well beyond what we have explored in this series. And we've always sort of studied it and talked about it alongside a problem. Because oftentimes, the joy that we're able to experience in the Christian faith is response to a specific challenge that this broken world gives to us. And if you're anything like me, you probably feel that among the hardest kinds of brokenness to deal with are when our relationships are broken. It is one thing for me to get sick. It is another thing for my car to break down. It is another thing to get an unexpected bill that puts burden on me. And it is a whole nother, much more severe pain for me when a brother or sister in the Lord or anyone has conflict with me, when our relationship is broken, when there isn't peace between me and another person, it is without a doubt one of the most painful experiences. And I imagine many people listening to this service have felt the same. I imagine that many people listening to this service are currently in conflict with someone who is dear to them, and it is very painful to be at odds with that person. It could be a family member, someone really close to you, even a spouse, that there's an intense disagreement with and it has caused animosity between the two of you. Or maybe a child or another extended family member or a close friend or a member of the church. Someone who did something to you at some point and you just can't seem to let it go. You just can't seem to get over it. And as I say that, I never want to dismiss how serious something that may have happened to you was. I never want to make you feel like, oh, you just need to let it go. Get over it. That's not... It's not the point, because sometimes really serious conflict things do happen, and really serious offenses are made. And we're left with these wounds about these broken relationships. It could be something momentary and very severe. I've heard many stories, and I've had stories in my own life where good friendships over something very instantaneous, like a brief but severe moment have fallen apart and there's never a repair there. That relationship goes from a great friendship, a great relationship to a broken relationship because of one 
major thing, or it could be a long time of small things adding up. So often our bitterness and brokenness in our relationships is from these little disagreements that have added up to an animosity between us and a lack of unity between us and another person. It could be something lifelong that you've been, that's been true since the beginning of that relationship with that person, or it could be something that's a new Development, And I want to make sure to back up for a moment here because we've talked a lot about the things that people have done to us. But if we are honest, there have been ways that we have hurt other people too. And in most situations, uh, you, the, the case is that that broken relationship is not just broken because of one person. It is oftentimes the case because of how a person responded and then another person responded and back and forth until the relationship was a mess. So if we're going to talk about the hurts that we have because of what other people have done to us, we also have to take ownership of the fact that we have contributed to this kind of pain in other people's lives also. Sometimes these kinds of things feel like they're just never going to be fixed. Many of us have things that have happened to us we just feel like we're never going to be able to get over, to overcome. But I'm going to suggest to you that there is a remedy for this or a part of a remedy that we so often do not consider when we think about these broken relationships Paul addresses these two friends of his, co-workers of the gospel, and they are at odds with each other, and he urges them, and he urges whoever he's writing this to, he says, help them to be reconciled to each other. And we oftentimes read this sort of separately and move on to the next section, but the truth is, what Paul is about to do is give a prescription for how to make that happen. And so as he moves on to verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. These are commands. He's telling them, he's telling the church to rejoice. Choose joy. Choose to engage in the joy that God has for you. The joy that he has explained Time and time again, chapter after chapter in this letter, and that he himself had experienced, he says, choose joy. And then as you read through these other things, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. That's a picture of a healed relationship, a gentle relationship, a peace-filled relationship. Why? Because of rejoicing. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Conflict with other people ever make you anxious? Anyone looking forward to a Thanksgiving meal where someone might be there, you're a little anxious that they might be there? Rejoicing is what helps us to not be anxious and bring healing in those relationships. And he goes on, and I, I found this so amazing. In verse 9, he says, Whatever you have learned or received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice. What has he gone on about for four chapters? Rejoice. Paul's saying, do you see my afflictions, my brokenness, my problems, my broken relationships? Guess what the solution has been? Rejoice. Choose joy. Not bitterness and resentment and anger. The Bible talks in many different places about preemptive joy. Rejoicing when the thing that you're mourning hasn't been fixed yet. And the reason that it does that is because joy, believe it or not, is not just a feeling that you get when God fixes the problem, it is actually part of the prescription for how to fix the problem. 
I don't have to say it again because you can pause and go back if you want to write that down. And it's worth writing down. We so often see the feeling of joy and we forget about the choice, the action of joy, the, the recognition that this is broken, this is messed up, I'm at conflict and I'm still going to choose to have joy and even joy with them. Jesus told his disciples that they were going to mourn and then they would have joy. And get this, he says, your joy will never be taken from you. Because it's secured in what God does. We've talked about things that God does, brothers and sisters, that give us reason to rejoice. But now we need to recognize that sometimes rejoicing is the choice that brings about an additional reason to rejoice. When we begin with joy, the brokenness we experience in our relationships has a possibility of being healed. When you are looking at someone who you're at odds with and you choose to look at them and instead of being bitter about what they did or didn't do and choose to recognize that God loves them and they're created in His image because in the end, no matter what they've done to you, those two things are always true. Or begin to look at all the other ways they've been a blessing to you. Suddenly you're able to celebrate who they are instead of being resentment over what didn't happen or what did happen that has been a brokenness to you. This is so important. Unity is stressed in the church as just unbelievably important among Christians. And the reason, if we're honest, that we struggle to find it is because we don't want to be joyful to one another. We want to be bitter. We want to hang on to resentment. And I know that they hurt us. I know that they hurt you. I know that it's hard. But Jesus went to the cross and prayed for people killing him. He is our model. He is who we are being transformed into. Jesus was able to have a sense of joy, even a sense of joy on the cross. This is so important. Joy is the prescription for actually bringing about the power of God. It says in Scripture that the kingdom of of God is not food or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy is part of how the kingdom of heaven comes into this world. When we choose joy instead of bitterness, whether it's in our relationship, and as I mentioned earlier, this is way bigger than broken relationships. It just so happens that in this case, he's talking about a broken relationship, and it's something that's deeply important to all of us, too. But the reality is, when we choose joy in any kind of brokenness, God actually is able to bring healing and restoration through that. There are some people who hear this, and they say, well, that just sounds like faking it. It's not. Because in Christ, you always have a reason to rejoice. So even if everything else in your world is falling down, you have Jesus. Rejoice in him, if nothing else. And you'll find as you do that, you are actually able to find healing in places you never thought there was healing. There are some people listening to this that need to look at that family member, look at that church member, look at that person in your life that has hurt you, and just celebrate them regardless of what they've done to you. And I know that sounds absurd, but that's the kingdom of God, friends. That's the kingdom of God. It's upside down and backwards, and thankfully, thankfully it is, because this world is messed up. And I am glad the kingdom is upside down and backwards from the way this world is. I want you to consider that I'm posting, it's weird when you're doing YouTube services, right? Because you can watch this whenever. We're posting this on the Sunday prior to Thanksgiving 2020. It's in the date, but just bear with me. 
You're headed towards a family gathering, potentially, even with COVID restrictions. I realize the truth is many people will be gathering with family. Or you're thinking about the brokenness in relationships as you head towards the holidays. And I want to challenge you to choose joy. To just commit and say, I am going to celebrate. And I'm even going to celebrate that person who's done harm to me. Watch the kind of healing that comes into your relationships. Watch the kind of healing when you walk into that room with that person who has harmed you, and instead of shooting a foul glance at them, or instead of avoiding eye contact with them, you smile and say, hey, I'm so glad to see you today. Watch what kind of restoration comes through that. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for all you do and all you're going to do. Lord, I expect to hear of great fruit in people's lives as a result of choosing joy. Joy is not just an emotional reaction. It is a choice. It is a posture we choose to live in where we will always rejoice no matter what because we always have a reason to rejoice because you if the whole world collapses around us, we have Jesus and it is enough reason to rejoice. He is enough. He's always enough. And so we thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the healing you're about to bring in people's lives. Lord, I pray that they would have testimonies to your goodness. Lord, I pray by your spirit you would work against bitterness and resentment in relationships and you would work towards healing and restoration. Thank you, Lord, for all you're going to do. In Jesus' awesome name, amen.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, may you go from this place recognizing that no matter what brokenness you might have, whether it's in a relationship or in some other way, there is always a choice to rejoice. And as you choose joy, the Lord will bring healing and restoration into your life and through your life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be ours forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.